is Gaining Altitude. Conversations worth navigating. Welcome to the fourth episode of Gaining Altitude, Conversations Worth Navigating. Now let's be honest. There are topics that are often considered taboo, uncomfortable, or too abstract for the workplace, like the topic of race, the realities of systemic racism, and the critical need for diversity, equity, and inclusion. For far too long, corporations have largely avoided having honest yet healthy dialogue on race. So while we often hear corporations advocating for diversity, for being honest, we sometimes find them struggling to define what that actually means, what progress looks like and feels like, and how to truly create a diverse and inclusive workplace. But whether you're a corporation or an individual, we all share responsibility to march toward a better tomorrow. The constant brutal realities of injustices, including constant additions of new names chanted, hashtagged, and memorialized, call on us to do better, to be better, for them, for all of us, as a world and as a society. And we can use conversations like these to bridge the gap to understanding and further build the inclusive world that we deserve. Now, today we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by Porter Braswell, CEO and co-founder of Jopwell, and host of the Harvard Business Review podcast titled Race at Work. Porter's powerful thought leadership has challenged the status quo and reinforced healthy dialogue about race, diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout organizations across the country, including right here at Delta Airlines. So let's talk, but better yet, let's learn and grow together. And as always, you, our viewers, are the heartbeat of this conversation. So join us by sharing your thoughts or questions that you have for Ed or Porter in the comment section on whatever platform you're using to view this live stream. And with that said, it's my pleasure to pass it over to our host, Delta CEO, Ed Bastian. Thanks, Jamar. Good to be with you today, and especially good to be with you, Porter. Thank you. Absolutely. for joining us. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Really, it's a continued conversation. We started earlier this year, and you had me as a guest on your podcast yeah. that you're doing for Harvard Business Review about race at work. And right after Porter and I had, had our conversation, I told him, you need to now be my guest. <laughs> and I didn't get to, uh, get to share with a broader audience what you have been doing. And, and you've got an amazing, amazing, at a really young age, success and track record in a really important and really strategic area that I think that we all throughout, not just Delta, corporate America, are looking to learn from. And particularly, how, how do we address race at work? So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for joining having us. me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about Porter, and he's got a, he's got a good list of accomplishments. So I'll just use a couple notes. Uh, 33 years old, which is, blows my mind. Uh, when I was 33, I was still, <laughs> I was still trying to figure out the subways in New York. I, was, I still struggle with the subways too. Yeah, so. yeah. But Porter lives in New York. Yeah. Uh, married one, one young, uh, young child. Uh, he's been named. Uh, there's a company, Jopwell. First of all, he's one of the founders of Jopwell, and they've been named by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of 100 most brilliant ideas. Uh, Fast Company, world's most innovative companies, and Business Insider, one of the hottest New York City companies to watch. That's Jopwell, the company he founded. Porter, personally, has been named by Fast Company Magazine as 100 Most Creative People. Uh, Cranes uh, has named him 40 Under 40. And Ernst & Young, this is a really cool award, Entrepreneur of the Year in New York last year in 2020, and a Nationals final on, on, the, on that full stage. Uh, he hosts Race at Work as his podcast with HBR. And in the midst of all of that, you know, managed to write a book as well, which we have here, uh, Let Them See You, uh, which he wrote uh, a couple years ago. And we're going to talk a little bit about the book. So, Porter, first of all, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, great to have you. And to get started, I'd like to, if you could tell us kind of how you got here. You know, I, I always enjoy people's story. Yeah. Uh, we all have our own unique stories, and I think people can, can learn from some of the things that you, you, you looked at and how you approached them to help them as they're creating their own stories for their futures. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, <clears throat> truly, thank you for having me here. Uh, I think every company should have this type of series to engage in the conversations that are worth engaging in. So thank you for leading that initiative and for being the host of that and for having incredible guests and for including me in that. Truly appreciate it. Um, you know, my quick backstory, I grew up in the type of household where to be successful, and I put air quotes around that, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you can go into finance. And that's basically it. 
my dad was the first person in his family to go to college, um, and, <clears throat> and he ended up being an attorney and then a state judge. And um, so I grew up in this household where at the dinner table, it was always you know, academics and what are you gonna do as a, as a profession? And when I was in high school, I went to the Lawrenceville School, which is a boarding school near Princeton, and Morgan Stanley was offering a diversity internship program for high school students, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, A, this is that industry finance, and B, you qualify for this, you should apply. So I got lucky, started working there my junior, senior summers in high school, went on to Yale, played basketball, and fully recognizing I wasn't going to the NBA, I continued in a very entry-level, diversity-focused pipeline and spent three summers interning at Goldman Sachs, which is where I started my career. I was there for three years buying and selling currencies. And while I loved my job, I wanted to break into a different industry, mainly technology. Because I, you know, growing up, again, at age 15, I got exposed to finance and that was it. And so I remember being kind of like a first or second year analyst at Goldman and starting to apply for tech jobs and ranging from large publicly traded companies to small companies to friend startups, and I couldn't break in and for the life of me. And the reason why is because companies kept saying that you didn't work at our non-diverse peers. And while, if you go back to the spring of 2014, all of the tech companies came out and said that there's a lack of diversity because the mm -hmm. pipeline doesn't exist. So here I am trying to bang on the doors and say, I want to break into this industry at any level, give me an entry level sales job chance. And I couldn't get the chance because I didn't work at another tech company, uh, despite my background. And so I had to build my own tech company. That was my result. I had to go out and build my own tech company. And fortunately, that was my outcome. Uh, but I built this business called Jopwell with my co-founder, Ryan, specifically to help diverse individuals get connectivity to organizations that have always claimed they can't find the talent. So Jopwell is a two-sided network. On one side, we have hundreds of thousands of members who self-identify, specifically being Black, Latinx, or Native American. On the other end, we work with 400 companies. Platform sits in the middle and facilitates connectivity. And so, again, my outcome was positive because I went out to build my own tech company, but it was absurd that that was how I had to break into technology. Well, I, I, I admire your passion. Uh, you, <laughs> you founded your company out of your frustration and you saw the clear need in the marketplace to be this connector yeah. for us all to, to learn how to, to better understand each other and give everybody opportunities for the future. So what have been some of your learnings from Joppa? What, as, you, as you now, and I know, I know part of it's in the book that you, you've yeah. written, but what, what, what is it that you're seeing that, that particularly black professionals, yeah. but diverse professionals broadly, are experiencing uh, in today's world? Yeah, so I've learned a lot. I've been so fortunate to be a part of this journey now you know, Joppa will be about 100 employees this year, and to come to work at the most diverse company I've ever seen, you know, majority female, largest ethnicity is African American, we're building, we're building what we tell corporate America that they can build. And what I've learned throughout this journey is something that I've always known, a couple of things. One, the talent has always been there. Uh, the pipelines have always existed. Companies have just um, not been creative enough to tap into them or not been willing enough to invest enough capital to actually authentically go out and invest resources to connect with these communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that I've always known from the beginning is that diversity is not charity work. And so before Joplo, um, you know, there, there was only nonprofits in this space and the nonprofits do fabulous work, coaching, training, mentoring, hand-to-hand -hand combat and really ensuring people are getting jobs and opportunities, but that doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. And corporate America has always thought of diversity as, oh, we're going to use a nonprofit to find diverse talent. And that never sat well with me. I don't understand why uh, solving a business challenge of a lack of diversity, which leads to better products and resources and helps companies produce revenue, why that's a charity. And so decided to build that for-profit business to, to really make sure that companies were taking it seriously. Um, and I think throughout it all, what we've realized is that these conversations, talking about diversity, talking about equity, talking about inclusion, it's something that we've been shouting from the roofs for the last seven years, and now corporate America is catching up to the realization that if you want to be the employers of tomorrow, you better understand your employees today and what drives and motivates them. And it's not the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you come from. People care about being their full self and showing up as who they are. Mm -hmm. And so for an organization, how do you create cultures that allow for that to thrive? And I think corporate America has kind of caught up to where we've always been. Yeah. And not just the employers and employees, but also looking at customers. Yeah. Because as I say at Delta all the time, 
we're not going to ever stop this journey, but we're certainly not going to take our foot off the pedal until our leadership and our, our workforce reflects the face of our customers. Absolutely. And it's an ongoing journey. It's not a moment in time. It's not this month's initiative. Mm -hmm. It's a part of everybody's responsibility and job to ensure we're thinking through how to build these cultures, connect with customers in the most authentic way that speaks to the values of your own organization. And it's, again, mo most importantly, it's everybody's job. And yeah. so I, I, I love that Delta is taking that approach. Absolutely. So let's talk about your podcast for, yeah. for a few minutes, Race at Work. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, we had a great conversation, had a great conversation. and I, I loved it. And I don't know if it's, sure if it's still out there or not, but Absolutely. anyone that wants to plug into it can go listen to it. But you asked me uh, a question as part of that, that conversation was, is it appropriate yeah. to discuss Race at Work? or when is it appropriate, or yeah. how is it appropriate? Because we know we have to have the conversations, yeah. right? We're never gonna get better if we don't talk about the things that we need to learn uh, about for the future. What's your view on that? You know, is it appropriate to be talking about race at work and why? Absolutely. So the answer is yes, and let me take a step back to explain why I even launched the podcast. So if you go back to when COVID was, is still, but when COVID was dominating every single headline, uh, alongside of that, George Floyd was murdered and everybody in the country was grappling with the history of this country and also living through COVID. And so living in New York City, I would literally look out of my apartment window and see people protesting for Black Lives Matter. And it was so frustrating for me that I couldn't go outside because I had, at the time, a 12 month old daughter at home. So I couldn't catch COVID. I wasn't willing to go outside and be around people. And so I felt so um, I don't know, frustrated, annoyed that I couldn't protest. So I took a step back and thought through, how could I protest? How could I lend my voice to something that matters to me so much? And what would be the appropriate voice to, to protest in? And, you know, thinking about my connectivity and the responsibility that I think comes with my platform, it's I've had access to folks like yourself and to have that type of dialogue around, okay, we're gonna talk about race, we're gonna do it through the form of a podcast so hopefully others can listen in and learn from perspectives. And I would learn and guests would learn and we would have this thoughtful dialogue that I would hope would help normalize the conversation of race in the workplace. And I felt that that was my form of protest. So I decided to do that with Harvard Business Review. And one of the questions that we ask all of our guests is should race be discussed at work? And so my reflection of hosting these dialogues um, is absolutely race should be discussed at work. And the reason why, again, going back to what we were just living through, when we were all virtual, if you turn this way and looked at a television screen, you would see literally a person being murdered in the hands of a police officer. And then you'd be expected to turn back this way to your computer screen and act like you just didn't see that. So how could you not talk about race? Uh, you have to, as an employer, allow people to Sh fully show up if you don't want them distracted at work. And so what we just lived through, you couldn't avoid that conversation. So organizations had to lean in and create space to allow people to unpack what they literally were witnessing as they turned their head side to side. And those companies that embraced that had more productivity from their employees. People got to know each other better. They got to know their colleagues better. They felt more connected. And being a former athlete, you know, it really resonates with me when you get to know your teammates and you wanna fight for your teammates, uh, amazing things get produced. And so I think it's the responsibility of employers to create that space to allow those conversations to be had because you're having it anyway. So how do you then welcome that into the course of a normal day? So what are some specific recommendations that young, say a young manager yeah. who's he or she is wrestling with this topic to want to better know their team to talk about what, what we all know is an obvious frustration we're all experiencing in today's society. But you know, not, you know, we've all been raised as corporate leaders here, yeah. not to talk about race, religion, you know, <laughs> politics. politics, right? Yeah. Um, and you're saying we should talk about it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of ways to go about it. There are a lot of general things I can say. Some of it requires common sense, time and place. 
Who are you addressing? How are you addressing it? Is this the first time you've addressed it? From a corporation perspective, have you had DEI initiatives in place before, or is this the first time you're jumping into it? So what's appropriate will differ company to company, person to person. Do you have personal relationships within the communities that you're trying to have conversations with? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's so much nuance to how you talk about this, but I think there are general things. One, be transparent about the organization is going to start to have these conversations and really start to explain the why behind these dialogues. If you just start jumping in talking about race without explaining why are you doing this, people are gonna be like, what, what is this? So start with why, make it top down, talk about what you've done in the past and what are appropriate settings and spaces to have these conversations. When you are having the conversations, what are the rules? Does everything go? Is everything fair game? Or do you keep it constrained to certain topics? Um, if somebody says something that's offensive, how do you react to that? So that in your reaction, people aren't, oh my God, I said the wrong thing, I can never engage again. So like, how, do, how should people respond when having these dialogues? And then ultimately, what's the outcome? What are you looking to achieve by having these conversations? And how can you measure that? So there's so many ingredients and variables that go into how do you create these dialogues. Again, this is an amazing space that you've intentionally created to have this conversation. It makes sense in the context of Delta and what you're looking to do for a broad customer base. Mm -hmm. So like, that's appropriate. So I think every company has to figure out that unique sauce and be thoughtful about it. And if they can create that, amazing things will happen. So I'm gonna take it on the other side of that question. As, as a diverse member of the team, what's your recommendation to the diverse members of the team in terms of how to engage when approached yeah. about, about the conversation? So there's a lot to that. One, it's okay to let people know that you're tired, that you know, you, you're doing your job, you get paid to do your job, and then oftentimes we as diverse individuals are asked to go do something else without necessarily being comp compensated for that. And compensation can look like the form of you know, different things. It could be money, it could be being recognized publicly. There's a, there's a lot of ways to draw mm -hmm. um, uh, support for people to, who are tasked to go above and beyond their job. But without that added form of incentive or being compensated for it, it's being, you're being asked to do a lot while being distracted from actually doing your job. So I think employers need to think about how to drive incentives for outcomes and conversations that they're looking to have from diverse individuals. The second thing is that it's okay not to speak on behalf of an entire community. Like I can't talk on behalf of the black population. I can talk about my experiences, what's happened to me in my life and how I experience the world, but I advise those that are being asked to share their perspective, talk through your lens and don't try to don't try to be the, you know, the barrier for the whole community because there's no singular experience. And that's okay, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have, to have that sense of responsibility. Um, and then lastly, if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, say you don't feel comfortable talking about it, you shouldn't be forced into having these dialogues just because you find yourself being the only in many situations. And that feeling of being the only is kind of like having a spotlight on you where you feel like you have to perform. And that's like a crazy place to be. Yeah. So you can choose to step in that spotlight or back away from it, and both are okay. I wanna talk for a moment about what you just mentioned about being exhausted. And I've had that conversation with a number of our black leaders you know, within the company. And that's been a big learning for me over these last couple of years. I didn't fully appreciate the responsibility, the pressure, the accountability to not only, as you say, do your job, but then represent your community and the company point of view in trying to reconcile differences or you know, potentially you know, divergent. Yeah. You know, uh, they, they say one thing, but they do another, and this person's not given that opportunity, and, but, but yet feeling the need to continue to, to lead the company forward and lead their team forward. And it's, it's, been, it's been a, first of all, I acknowledge it, and I, I uh, respect uh, those leaders who, who bring that forward. But I also want to continue to learn on that topic. Yeah, so you know, it's not, the, the exhaustion of it, it's not necessarily, and it's different for every person, right? But it's not necessarily when you're asked to do an action, an activity. Mm -hmm. uh, typically what ends up happening, and I'll, I'll share a story, because I think this, this captures it really well. There's a Jopwell uh, member who I was having a mentoring conversation with and we started the conversation by me just asking like, how's your day? She's like, you know, I've had a really tiring day. 
I was like, well, explain what happened. So she works in finance. She's a she's Latina. And she was walking as she walked in to the office on a sales and trading floor. And for those that don't know, it's a huge mass. Imagine like a football field with a lot of computer screens. She walked into the sales and trading floor and she decided to wear her hair naturally that day. And as she got to her desk with her colleagues, somebody stood up and said, hey, it's Jenny from the block. And everybody started laughing and she like awkwardly chuckled. But before she even sat down, people were commenting on her look because she wore her hair naturally. She sat down, started doing her job. Then she went into, um, uh, I guess, a team meeting in a room. And somebody said something that was funny. And before she laughed, she checked herself to make sure she was going to do her corporate laugh. And so she was explaining to me how her day was going. And I'm like, that is so exhausting that you have to think about how are you going to laugh? You have to answer, you have to awkwardly chuckle because somebody makes a comment about how you look. That's tiring. That's not like being asked to go do a certain initiative. That's just being who you are showing up and you have to constantly play, you're playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers. You're playing chess. That's tiring. That's like exhausting. Right. And so it's not on her to try to call this out for the corporation. The corporation needs to be aware that just being underrepresented, you're going to experience those types of things. So corporations need to be proactive about creating structures and systems and policies to not allow that stuff to happen. And when it does happen in the moment, from the majority culture, check your employees, check your peers, check your colleagues, say that's not appropriate. It doesn't have to always be that person that's being affected to call it out. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's responsibility to call it out. And that's Absolutely. the only way you want to root it out. But that's, that's tiring. That's tiring, that's exhausting. Um, you, you also mentioned something about you know, the need to continue to you know, learn, continue to advance you know, the, the, the agenda. But yet for, for corporate America, one of the, the real challenges I, I hear from a lot of my peers is that they don't believe, for whatever reason, there's a big enough pipeline of talent. They, they feel like the, and, and listen, I, I, there's, there's a real competition out there yeah. for, for a great diverse talent. Yeah. There, there, there needs to be, and there's a competition for talent at all levels, yeah. you know, regardless of race or, or creed or who you are. Um, how, how do we fight against that? Absolutely. You know, how, do we, how do we bust that, that paradigm? And it's shocking. I mean, you heard it, I think, uh, you know, the guy who runs Wells Fargo, you know, recently got into a whole heck of trouble when he was talking, he used that as an excuse. Absolutely. So again, let's go back to my story. So when I was trying to break into this industry of technology, I wasn't being hired because the feedback I got was you didn't work in this exact seat at our exact competitor, who also, by the way, is not diverse. Mm -hmm. It became this like circular argument that I can't break in because I don't work there. Like that doesn't make sense. And so I think it's lazy recruiting when you stick to just a JD and you're basically saying on that JD, if you don't do this exact job at our exact competitor, you don't, you're not qualified. You're not going to find success here. That's lazy recruiting. The talent has always existed. It's on companies and hiring managers and recruiters to be more thoughtful about what does it mean to actually be qualified to work in this capacity. So what we push for at Jopwell is persona hiring, valuing transferable skill sets. So if you come from sales and trading and you're in sales covering you know, really competitive markets, you could probably do an entry level sales job at a tech company. Or if you're working in consulting and you're helping problem solve, you could probably break into technology in a sales capacity. So like, what are some of the transferable opportunities that exist? Mm -hmm. And when you find talent that has those transferable skill sets, it's important to understand that's not lowering the bar. Because when they get the job, not only are they going to master the craft of it, they're going to bring an entirely different skill set and perspective mm -hmm. to that organization. That's an asset. So we got to get out of this lazy recruiting of JDs and really start to be thoughtful about who are the types of folks, experiences, and backgrounds that we value because we can teach them how to do Salesforce or whatever. But we need more diverse people at the top with these incredible experiences. And I think once you break into that mindset, you'll find diverse talent all day long. It, talent has always existed. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I completely agree with you. And I, I look at, I would take it a step further rather than just lazy recruiting. As leaders, we need to be unapologetic yeah. about that. That's talent we're looking for. Yeah. 
that there is a unique attribute that diversity brings us. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Absolutely. It's the differences that make us better. It'll make us a better company for a longer time. So it's not a, this is not a philanthropic or a, a kind of a, a do-gooder uh, thing. You know, there's, there's benefit to that. Absolutely. But the reality is, is that we need to be, and, and I think we, you know, over time in our country, unfortunately got to, to it turned into a quota system, which is, this yeah. is not what it is, but at the same time have to be very clear as to what we're looking for. And I, I, use, I use Delta as an example. Last year, we said we do not have enough black leaders on our board of directors. And I said publicly, the next person that gets appointed to the Delta board of directors, it's gonna be an awesome person, yeah. but the person's also gonna be a black professional. Uh, and if I can say that, at the highest level of my company Absolutely. and be public about it and be unapologetic about it, why aren't we doing that in more parts of our companies? Absolutely. I think the company that stands up and says publicly, we want just the most highly skilled, incredible, thoughtful people to apply. It's our job to figure out where you're going to thrive. Just apply. We'll, we'll make sure you get into the right seat. They're going to win. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me about your book. What led you to write it? and. Uh, <coughs> What, what, what kind of feedback have you gotten from it? Yeah, so, so I wrote the book because as I was trying to break into this tech industry, um, I was constantly reaching out to people to try to mentor me. And for the life of me, I couldn't get people to mentor me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember thinking to myself, if I ever broke into this industry or if I ever started my own business, I was gonna be thoughtful about saying yes to mentoring and saying yes to getting on the phone and just answering questions. So I blocked off every other Friday on my calendar. Now it's about one Friday a month, but I still do it, where I'm intentional about taking calls for people trying to be entrepreneur or trying to break in or how do you raise capital or whatever. And so part of those conversations, what I realized is that everybody kept asking me the same questions. How do I, how do I show up in the workplace as being diverse? Um, I, how do I deal with imposter syndrome? Um, how do I go around the obstacles that I'm facing? And so I was having these conversations so frequently where I decided a way to have these dialogues at scale would probably be the vehicle of a book. And if I wrote a book to the diverse communities of the world, A, it could help them navigate what it's like to be a person of color in the workplace, and B, probably more importantly, to have non-diverse folks understand the obstacles and challenges that we experience. And so if the book could bring people together to help understand that, then I thought it was a worthwhile experience to go out and write that book. And so it's called Let Them See You. And um, Penguin Random House is my partner in that and very excited that I you know, wrote that. It was cool to walk into a Barnes and Noble and see the book, but that was yeah. fun. <laughs> well, I encourage everyone to pick it up. I, I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, I've read about it, but I told Porter, uh, we had lunch today, I'm gonna make sure that's on my, that's my shelf to read here. Cool in the next few months, I'd encourage you all to pick it up because it looks, looks like a fascinating, fascinating piece of work. One last question yeah. for you and then we're gonna turn to our, to our audience for questions. Uh, you're also an athlete. Uh, you, you're, you're very humble about your, your basketball days, but you were a four-year starter um, at Yale University yeah. and uh, uh, play, playing uh, Division I uh, uh, basketball at the, pretty close to the highest level that, that exists. I, I also uh, read up a little bit about you. I understand you were, you were a calm, cool, collected <laughs> uh, three-point, or not three, three, free throw shooter. Yeah. And you, you, had a, you had a reputation of being able to be very focused on that. Um, I did a podcast for a fellow by the name of Don Yeager recently, and his series is about you know, people growing up in sports and chemistry and teamwork and the stuff you learn from that that you take into uh, success in, yeah. your, in your future. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, you know, once, once an athlete, always an athlete. And so the things that I used to push back on being an athlete um, because people would say, oh, you went to Yale. What sport did you play? And it was always this presumption right. that it had to be a sport. And so I always fought back on that identity of being an athlete until I had a conversation with Magic Johnson, who is an investor in Jopwell and more importantly, a really close friend where he was like, never push back on that identity. It's a unique skill set that you bring to the table in addition to everything else you bring to the table. So never push back on that. And that really helped me start to frame and think about me as a leader in the business, what does that look like? And one of the things I've learned from being an athlete and how I think now about being a CEO 
you know, I don't, I, I didn't know what it was like to be a CEO and still like, what is it like to be a CEO? I know what it means to be a coach. I know what it means to motivate folks, to have people bring their full self and mm -hmm. to encourage them and give them the ball when they're hot and coach them when they're not and get people through certain things. And so uh, make sure it's clear. What are we trying to execute? How do we know when we have found success? Making everybody believe it's not the outcomes. It's the processes. It's the day to day grind. It's the practice that goes into it. That's the only thing that matters. And outcomes will be outcomes. Can't control it. So I know what that means. And so that's how I approach running Jopwell. And I want people who have that athletic mindset. I don't care if they've played sports, but I care that they want to collaborate, they want to be good teammates, they can speak up, they're competitive, they want to win. Um, you know, I want to surround myself with, with those types of people and you get, you learn that through playing sports, but you can learn it elsewhere as, as well. And so, you know, I, I am, I'm so fortunate and I feel so blessed that sports have, you know, it's a large part of my life and I've learned a lot through sports and it's something that um, I hope to instill in, in my children. That's really cool and magic is a great, He's a great friend of mine as well and a great, great mentor. And it's Incredible. Ama amazing, amazing leader, yeah. amazing leader. Jamar, we're going to turn it back to you. Well, this is a truly powerful conversation. Lots of engagement online from our customers and, and employees. So spot on here. We'll start the audience Q&A with three rapid fire questions. Um, so both of you guys can just submit. And maybe uh, Porter, you want to start and then Ed, you can follow up. The first question, what's something you've learned about yourself during the pandemic? Ooh. Um, <clears throat> something I've learned through the pandemic. Okay, well, I, my wife gave birth to our first uh, child, daughter, and I've learned patience. Um, I've learned um, that there's no reason to have an edge of yourself. Uh, and that by showing how you're vulnerable and your insecurities and letting that be publicly known, it makes you a better leader. And so my daughter has taught me a lot uh, throughout the pandemic. No, she'll continue to <laughs> teach you as you go, I, I assure you. I, I'd say I, I've learned a lot about resilience, my own personal resilience, as well as our company's resilience and what that means. Uh, I don't think any of us had a clue about what that word meant prior to the pandemic. We thought we knew. Yeah. We thought we were good at that. We thought we were real great about trying to keep all the balls in the air in balance and, until we hit the wall and realize we're going to have to make some decisions. We're going to make some life choices. We're going to make some business choices to be able to, to, to take our people through, you know, the worst, the worst challenge of our, of our lifetime. Now, Porter, you've written a book, you have a podcast. So what podcasts are you listening to or books that you're reading right now? Um, wow. So I listen to a lot of audio books. So I'm always on the road and trying to digest a lot of content. The current audiobook I'm listening to is called Talent Code, and it's, uh, it's a look into um, how, how certain cultures and communities and groups of individuals have found success being really concentrated on learning a craft. Um, because I think you could be a lifelong learner in a variety of different things. So I'm always kind of looking for those types of motivational podcasts or books that help me you know, kind of think through what I could be doing differently or better. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm, I'm currently reading uh, Hubert uh, Jolie's book, Heart of Business. Uh, Hubert was a, is, is a good friend. He, he ran uh, Best Buy and he was in the travel business before and so I've known him for a number of years. And talking about leadership you know, from an empathetic view, from a, you know, the heart of leadership, not just the, not just the result. It's, it's, you say it's the process. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what you put into it and what you're intentionally about putting into it. And the outcomes will follow. Yeah. And then you don't start with the outcome. Yeah. All right, our last rapid fire question. So one of our mantras here at Delta is that no one better connects the world. So what's a quote or mantra that keeps you motivated every day? Oh man, I, I wish I could be more um, poetic about a quote. Uh, faith to me is important. Uh, uh, I, that to me is, that, that's who I am. And so it's not necessarily a quote or, or um, a phrase, but it's a belief that, you know, I'm walking in my, in my journey. I'm walking out the journey I'm meant to be walking while living um, this, on this earth. And so uh, I think having space to think about that every day and to pray, or pray on that every day uh, is what motivates me. So. Yeah, I, I, and I can see that in you. Uh, you're, you're very intentional and you're, you're, you're at peace with yourself, which is uh, 
which is a great attribute for such a young age. You've got, you've got a lot of wisdom that you've, obviously a lot of people have fed into you uh, along, along the way. A lot of great people have fed into you. Um, yeah, I, I, people have heard me say this, uh, Jamar. I, I, I'm still in this, you know, every day we've got to remind ourselves that you know, we're not through this crisis yet and that this reveals the character of our company. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the decisions we take today, decisions I take today, are going to reflect on, on in my view and our view as to the character of our company. Great. Next, we have an employee question, and it's for you, Porter. Companies are now looking at more skills-based hiring, or as you called it, persona hiring. And the mindset of the hiring managers has to shift with that. So what we're seeing is systems and processes in companies, including companies like Delta, they are changing. But what advice would you give for those hiring managers who have to really begin to reframe the way they view talent? Yeah, I would say it needs to be encouraged, again, at all levels. But it also there also has to be some level of, if you don't really believe it, let's talk about it. Because I think oftentimes folks are told what to do and they feel like they can't express themselves. And so I think there needs to be a thoughtful dialogue and space given to hiring managers. If they're expected to do something different, give them the chance to share their insecurities or share what they're nervous about and really get to a place of understanding, again, as to why it's important to recruit for transferable skills and, and skill-based hiring. And allow people, give the trust to hiring managers that they'll they'll come to that conclusion if they're allowed to challenge it up front. And then once you explain it, and hopefully there's some alignment, you then have to be clear about your expectations in terms of what you want the outcomes to look like. And people need to get on board with that. And so, but I think that there needs to be space to allow the hiring managers, if this is a new concept for them, to, to be able to share, you know, their experiences kind of going into it. I agree with that. All right, so we have another employee question. Uh, the last 18 months have revealed so many inequities and pandemic privilege. And at the same time, there's so much noise about division. Realizing we have customers, employees, and society coming to work, how do you recommend navigating division while pushing forward on equity? Well, I think what's important is that there's a conversation around what is equity and, and understand, because I think we throw these terms out, uh, equality, equitable, what does that mean? So before we can break down divisions and what does it mean to be equitable, let's, let's define what, what equitable outcomes look like. Mm -hmm. So the way I encourage people to think about it is that equal is not equitable. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you're seeing higher, or sorry, if you're seeing lower retention rates from certain communities, if you're seeing lower promotion rates from certain communities, you, if you're seeing lower hiring rates from certain communities, you can't, you can't put something, you can't put a program in place that's equal for, for all. You have to create opportunities for those communities that are disproportionately falling out in certain parts mm -hmm. to give them the chance, the same level of chance to succeed. Those are equitable opportunities. It may not be equal, but they're equitable. To have a black focus, focused initiative, that might be equitable. Mm -hmm. And so I think corporations don't break down what these terms mean. I and mean, we, we talk about this, what does diversity mean? And we say we have a diversity challenge. Well, what does that mean? And so getting comfortable being specific about these terms is so important. And then once there's agreement and alignment on what these terms mean, then how, how should they show up in the workplace? Uh, and again, what are the outcomes we're looking for? How do we measure it? And how are we going to be transparent about that? So as I think about that question, I think about really breaking down these terms so people can understand it and then choose for your own organization like what makes sense and what has happened in the past? What's the context? I, I, I've spoken at a couple of events in the last couple of weeks uh, on this topic. Uh, and I, I raised you know, what you just said. Diversity is, is, is not a new topic for mm -hmm. us, right? It's, it's uh, for, for all of us in corporate America. Uh, it's, it's been important to, to, to make progress in. But it's such a big word. Yeah. It encompasses so many different aspects and who can argue with diversity? I mean, I think everybody appreciates, um, but it gave also people a place to hide yeah. and you, you a chance to kind of define, define it as you wanted to define it and also not talk about you know, the areas of diversity where you're not diverse in. And the thing I, I see that's different today, 
I can tell you, at, with me personally and with our company, but I think increasingly corporate America is we are being more explicit, more intentional, more direct about what it means in getting some of those those you know the, the places where people can hide, yeah, uh, uh, you know, blown up, and you know just kind of trying to be more transparent about where we are and the yeah. progress we're making, and we're not where we need to be. And you know it's okay to say that because yeah. it's a fact, but it's not okay to say that you are where you need to be, right? I mean, you, how do you get better and how do you keep getting better and what are we doing to continue to progress every single day? And this conversation is one of those things that's helping me get better. In the spirit of being specific, we have another employee question for you, Porter, about specificity. Can you talk about bringing your full self to work in a level of detail? We know you talk about it in your book, but when you talk about bringing your full self to work, how can a company actually support that? Perhaps they need to first understand what that means. Yeah, so, you know, how that hits me, that how that question hits me is, is when I think about my full self, like, who, who am I? And how do I identify? What, what, what are things that matter to me? And so my identity shift over time. Right? I went from being my, my identity being rooted in an athlete to my identity being rooted as a husband. Now my identity is rooted in being a father. So how I show up to work has changed. Mm -hmm. Bringing my full self to work now is very different than what it was 10 years ago. And it's going, I'm 33, so it's gonna be very different in 10 years from now. But allowing me to work at an organization where all of those identities add to the culture. I don't want to say they fit in because we shouldn't look for people to fit in. We should mm -hmm. look for people to add to the culture. Right. So if individuals can bring that identity where they find themselves, you know, again, when George Floyd was murdered, how, how could I show up as a person who was mad and frustrated and sad? How could I show up to work like that? Um, you know, it's different for me running the company and building the company of tomorrow that I hope every organization is striving for, where it's encouraged to have these dialogues. But for organizations that have been slow to encourage those dialogues, that's really tough for a person to show up like that in the workplace. And that's, again, going back to the dialogue of it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so bringing your full self to work, in my mind, means bringing all your identities, being the father, being the husband, being an athlete, being an entrepreneur, being somebody who's building a business for the first time, being vulnerable, showing my insecurities, like that's me showing up. And if that doesn't jive with people, then you know I'm probably not the most effective leader. But for those that it does jive with, then I think Joppel is a pretty fun place to work. So if I could bring those identities, then my expectation is that everybody else brings those, their full identities to work as well. Yep. And I think it creates a beautiful culture if we all believe we can do that at the same time, because we'll produce better products and we'll win. Yeah. Um, how I take what, and I, I agree completely with what you said. You know, for us it's about, you know, thinking about the whole person, not just bring themselves to work, but how do we take care yeah. of the whole person? The pandemic has, has shown the vulnerabilities that we have all had to our health and the health epidemic, the things that we took for granted. But it's also exposed the emotional imbalance that exists yeah. in society today and we've all been marked I don't care who you are I've been marked you've been marked to Mars we've all been marked by what we've gone through and to somehow pretend that we're <laughs> it's just crazy yeah. and we we got we got to be there for people and we got to meet them where they're at and provide support and you know, Delta you know Dr. Ting is doing a great job of getting us coaches and nurses mm -hmm. and people that can kind of we can talk to as we have issues and try and we're struggling with this. It's about your financial yeah. self. You know, we've, we've, we've had winners and losers coming out of the pandemic. In our business, we've had, you know, people have really struggled yeah. uh, financially you know, because we haven't had the ability to, to be where we wanted to be and we thought we'd be along, along the, the financial path. And the financial insecurities and vulnerabilities often feed <coughs> into the emotional imbalances and eventually physical imbalances. Yeah. And so we're providing financial coaches through Operation Hope and John Hope Bryant, my good friend, and what we're doing to take care of the financial. Well, and, and then finally, your social yeah. self. You know, when people look out in the world and they see, they see, they see the you know what's happened in in Minneapolis a year and a half ago, or they see what why people are angry in the streets, or they see on sustainability and what's the pathway to a to a better future for your children. 
there, there's, there's a tremendous amount of the divisiveness that exists in society. And how do you make sense of that? And how do you put that? You talk about the whole person. Well, that's, that's a whole lot, yeah. right, yeah. To, to address. But if we're not talking about it and we're not giving people the opportunity to plug in and realize it's a journey, you're never, you're never going to arrive. But it's important that we're, we're you know, doing everything we can to meet people where they're at and prov provide support as we can. I think it's going to be a critical competency for businesses going forward, particularly in our business, which is a people business. It's a service business. It's about taking care of each other. That's going to win in the marketplace. And the better job we do taking care of our people, the better job they're going to be able to do taking care of you as our customer. And we're going to just clobber the competition. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Porter, you mentioned exhaustion um, a few times throughout today's chat, and that's certainly resonating with a lot of our viewers. Uh, what advice uh, or words of encouragement would you give to those viewers? Um, and can you also speak on the importance of mental health as folks maybe experience those feelings? Yeah, so again, everybody deals with it differently. So how I deal with being exhausted might differ from how somebody else. So for me, I handle my exhaustion by surrounding myself with people that I love and that I trust. I have a tremendous partnership with my wife where I can unload on her and tell her everything that I'm feeling, where she can do the same with me. I'm fortunate that I have you know, friends in my life where I can be open and transparent and honest about what I'm experiencing, what I'm insecure about, and they build me up. I get, I get text messages from friends that, that tell me that they're praying for me and stuff like that. So like, I have a strong group around me of folks who truly care about me. And I think when it comes to ex exhaustion, it helps relieve that when you know that there are people in this world who genuinely care about you. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to invest in relationships outside of work, invest in your family, invest in the people that truly care about you, and be there for them as mm -hmm. much as they are for you. And I think that for me, again, I can only speak on my behalf, but for me, that helps with exhaustion because people will listen, and most importantly, they will accept it. They don't push back on me. They don't say, oh, you're not thinking about this correctly. They're just like, wow, you know, they empathize with me. And that really helps me because it lets me know I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. That helps <laughs> a lot. Uh, and then in terms of mental health, I think it's something that we all grapple with. We, if you don't think you're grappling with it, you probably need to see somebody. It's <laughs> something that we all grapple with as human beings. Um, we were forced into, we have all these traumatic experiences that are constantly hap still happening. Mm -hmm. And if you're not talking about it or thinking about it or expressing yourself, you, you, need, a, you need to. You need to. Um, and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to tell your employer you need space. Um, you know, I think for employers, we have to be thoughtful and know that people are tired. They are struggling with mental health. So be proactive. One of the things we just did at Jopwell, which I hope, which I wish I did sooner, to be honest, is that uh, in two weeks, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure the exact date, but in two weeks, we're just giving the day off. We're shutting down the business to allow people just to have a day off. I should have done that before. Uh, and, um, but we have to be proactive about giving the space and giving the time. Uh, and knowing that people are tired and so being proactive about it. That's awesome. Well, this has been a powerful conversation. Um, but we have one final question for you, Porter, which we ask all of our guests and then we'll pass it over to Ed for closing remarks. Um, how do you think that we can all better connect the world? So I think the things that jump out to me, you know, it, before this, we had a chance to break bread. And to me, breaking bread, having meals, sitting and putting your phone down and having a dialogue over food, I think is a way that we can all get closer, do better, connect with each other. Mm -hmm. um, it forces you to sit and be present and not be distracted, mm -hmm. ask questions, listen, respond. And I think you see the kindness and the goodness in folks when you take the time to put everything away and just break bread. And I think if we can all just share more meals with each other, we'd be a much better, more connected world. And sharing meals on Delta Airlines is especially a great place to, uh, to break bread. Uh, Porter, thank you for this conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've, uh, you know, first time we talked, I, I, uh, I made note of you. I, you. You've got something that I want to get inside of and understand what's, what's driving your, your, your thinking and, and your perspective and bring it to our people here at Delta, to our customers who are with us. Thank you for joining us. I have a, um, 
I, I have an instinct that you're going you're gonna to make, you're a very young man, uh, you've done a lot of good, you're going to make a big impact in this world. And uh, I'm glad that you're on our journey together and that we're going to learn from each other and hopefully grow together and do some great things for our world. Right. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all uh, for being with us today. It's a uh, conversation that needs to continue to be had, and we're going to be joining you soon uh, next month again with our next guest. Awesome. Thank you, Porter. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you to our employees, customers, and communities for joining us for our fourth episode of Gaining Altitude. And we hope to see you at our next one. But in the meantime, you can also catch Ed's first two episodes of Gaining Altitude with Tristan Walker and Danny Meyer on board your next flight in the series section of Delta Studio. And as always, please share your feedback and get the latest updates on delta.com slash gainingaltitude. Until next time, I'm wishing you all blue skies. Please take care and stay safe.